Welcome to the New York Botanical Garden Science Conservation and Humanities webinar, supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We're very happy that you're joining us from across the United States and worldwide for our webinar entitled Beyond Barriers, Accessing Nature for People with Disabilities. Please note that this virtual event will be closed captioned and will include a secondary webpage with live captions in Spanish. Instructions on how to enable these features can be found in the chat. I'm Samantha DeCunto, reference librarian at the Lewester T. Mertz Library and a proud ally for the disabled communities. I'm a white woman with brown hair, brown eyes. My pronouns are she, her. Today I am wearing a pink floral dress and behind me are some plants, a bookshelf with some books. With me are my colleagues, Vanessa Sellers, director of the New York Botanical Gardens Humanities Institute, and Charles Zimmerman, collections and outreach administrator for the NYBG's William and Linda Steer Herbarium. We are delighted and honored to welcome today's speakers, horticulture therapist, Phyllis D'Amico and Ann Miori, garden educator and NYBG's Edible Academy, Brooke Gibbard, and Desiree Austin, a volunteer at the Edible Academy and a participant at the New York Foundlings Community Pre-Vocational Program. Together, they will share their experiences of teaching and practicing therapeutic horticulture. This morning's program is held in conjunction with the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and will examine the impact of this important legislation for people with disabilities access to the natural world. We are also looking forward to discussing with you the many unique ways in which therapeutic horticulture can provide positive benefits for the mind, body, and spirit. Now back to Charles, who will give some further logistics about today's webinar. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Um, so after today's presentations today, we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience. At any time today, you may type your questions into the Q&A module, which is accessible via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you're experiencing any kind of technical issues or have difficulty hearing, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your window to send uh, either a private message to me or to the rest of the panelists. And you can also send me an email and I'll put my email into the chat window in just a minute. Um, to enable English language captioning, you can click the closed captions button at the bottom of your Zoom window and then click show subtitles. Spanish language captions are available through an external link, which will also be provided in the chat. As a reminder, this presentation will be recorded, archived and shared online on the NYBG Humanities Institute Lecture Library page. So to introduce our first speaker, I'll give it back to Samantha. Thank you, Charlie. Our first presentation is shared by Phyllis D'Amico and Ann Miori. Phyllis is a lifelong educator and a regis registered horticulture therapist with the American Horticulture Therapy Association. During her decades long career with the New York Public Schools, she served as the lead science teacher at the New Jersey Regional Day School, where she developed a model horticulture therapy program for children and adolescents with developmental disabilities. She is also the program coordinator for the NYBG Horticulture Therapy Certificate Program and has been an instructor with the Adult Education Department since 1988. Welcome, Phyllis. Anne is a licensed social worker in, the New, York, in New York and a registered horticulture therapist with the American Horticulture Therapy Association. Her work at the New York Botanical Garden includes serving as the horticulture therapy program coordinator for Thrive, which partners with the Bronx BA's Resilience and Wellness Center. She also serves as the program advisor and faculty member of the Th horticulture therapy program at NYBG and has served as a faculty member of the horticulture therapy certificate program she has also served as an instructor for NYBG's Edible Academy. Anna has also been the Garden Projects Coordinator for Bond Secure's Charity Health System in Suffern, New York since 2011. 
where she is responsible for designing and managing therapeutic garden spaces and conducting horticulture therapy programming in the accessible and therapeutic Garden of Hope at the Good Samaritan Hospital. Welcome, Anne. I'll hand it over to you to begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha, and good morning to all. Anne and I are honored to be here on the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act to share with you some information about the value of therapeutic horticulture and experiences from our practice. The Americans with Disabilities Act is one of America's most comprehensive civil pieces of civil rights legislation it prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else. That is to participate fully in the mainstream of American life. Access to nature should not be viewed as a privilege. It is very much a civil right for all people. The ADA's Title III section, Public Accommodations, provides a set of standards for accessible design which guide professionals from a variety of horticultural fields to design parks, recreational areas, gardens, and other natural areas that are accessible and safe for people with disabilities. In today's presentation, we will see many examples of accessible design features in gardens and other natural places. But in the true spirit of the ADA, let's also consider access to opportunities that nature offers in terms of therapeutic benefits, another right of all people of all abilities. But first, let's examine the roles inherent in the people-plant relationship and take a look at some of the theoretical foundations that support the use of nature as a therapeutic medium. Some basic observations about plants reveal that they're a lot like people. Plants are living things. They have need for water, sun, rest, and elements extracted from the air and soil. They respond to care given to them or lack of it. Their life cycle is germination, growth, maturation, reproduction, senescence, and death. Plants are dynamic. They are always changing. A bud appears leaves change color, a fruit is ready for harvest. They're also adaptable and resilient. Plants often meet challenges and survive in less than ideal conditions. The parallels between plants and people run deep. Without plants, people would not be able to live. Miss me or you're muted. My apologies. This relationship is vital to our existence as a human species. The inclination to affiliate with them, a biophilic response, lies at the foundation of why the people-plant relationship is effective when used as a therapeutic tool. Edward Wilson and Stephen Keller referred to this as biophilia hypothesis, emphasizing the beneficial role that plants and nature play in mental and physical health, productivity, and well being. We can view this innate tendency from an evolutionary perspective as well. Having developed as a species over millions of years, beginning when our environments were predominantly plant filled, because our thought processes and the very understanding of our existence evolved in this milieu over such a long period of time, we can conclude that using plants and natural elements to engage the body and mind can create a congruent experience for those with whom we work. Our roots, the roots of the natural, the use of natural environments as plant life as a therapeutic medium has its roots dating back to ancient cultures who recognized that plants were important not only to their survival, but also to their well-being. 
This modality took root in American culture in the late 1700s, shortly after the birth of our nation. It is noted that ben Dr. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and considered to be the father of American psychiatry, documented that laboring in farm fields had positive effects on his mentally ill patients. Based on these observations, the grounds of Friends Hospital in Philadelphia included landscape shaded paths through grassy meadows and gardens and gradually agricultural and gardening activities were included in both public and private psychiatric hospitals. The use of horticulture to improve the care of veterans took a large step forward in, during World War I. The enormous number of returning wounded veterans to US hospitals precipitated the start of horticulture in the use and its use in the clinical setting. Initially, horticulture was used in occupational and recreational therapies and then used in psychiatric rehabilitation. In the upper right, we see an image from 1919 of veterans with disabilities working at the New York Botanical Garden, tending to the spring peonies. From this arose many garden club volunteer programs, the participants of which participated in these national efforts to engage in gardening like the Victory Garden movement. Not only was food produced through this movement, but in terms of therapeutics, it offered people the opportunity to experience an emotional benefit of feeling a sense of purpose and in being part of a solution to the food scarcities that were occurring across the United States. Now, let's take a look at the thoughts that are foundational in the therapeutics of horticulture. William James, also known as the father of American psychology, offered the first course in psychology at Harvard during the latter half of the 18th century. His work on attention is still referenced today. He explains that there are two types of attention. The first is involuntary attention. It is passive and reflexive. It has the advantage of being effortless. Attending to something of great interest is not hard work. This type of attention calls for simple and direct responses rather than those that take advantage of one's higher mental processes. In contrast, there is voluntary or directed attention. This does require work or effort and it allows us to focus selectively upon the environment and it's under our control. Directed attention allows us to engage in higher mental processing skills, such as planning and problem solving. Modern daily living is hectic and chaotic and we become fatigued mentally. We are bombarded constantly with so much noise, movement, movement and visual complexity that our surroundings can overwhelm us and lead to damaging levels of psychological and physiological excitement. Mental fatigue syndrome is an excess of directed energy, attention, decreasing our capacity. And here you can see the ways that uh, mental fatigue takes away from our everyday functioning. Stephen and Rachel Kaplan, environmental psychologists and pioneers, are known for their work in attention restoration, and this was beginning back in the 1970s. The attention restoration theory posits that when viewing and experiencing nature, a different part of our brain is energized than we used for high attentional focus. Direct attention is a limited resource and it's subject to fatigue. The attention restoration theory posits that when viewing nature, it energizes a different part of the brain. Let's take a look at the restorative experience. The Kaplan's research found that natural environments had relaxing and restorative benefits for people. Plant-dominated environments are less complex 
They reduce arousal and therefore reduce stress. There are four components involved in having a restorative experience. First, being away. This provides a setting that is so different than the stressful setting that there's a feeling of escape. Forest, mountains, lakes, all provide restorative experiences, but it doesn't have to be distant. Urban dwellers can access the nearby nature of parks and public gardens, providing a place to be away. Secondly, extent. Extent is not defined by physical size, but by conceptual size. For example, a terrarium or a vegetable plot or a fairy garden may provide for one person what acres of wilderness provide for another. Third, fascination. This elicits volu involuntary attention. For example, you don't have to focus your attention on what you're doing. Fascination causes one to notice patterns effortlessly, such as the direction a bee moves on a sunflower, the play of sun, and shade with the movement of clouds, or the sounds and motions of leaves in the breeze. And lastly, compatibility. A person looks for resonance with the natural setting and their individual inclination. For example, hiking, fishing, wildlife discovery. Then there is an important study from 1984 that gives further support to the restorative environment and illustrates that actually nature can actually have surprising healing powers. A most significant study that gave weight to the impact of nature on recovery was Roger Ulrich's 1984 research demonstrating that patients recovering from gallbladder surgery who had windows with views of trees compared with patients whose windows viewed a brick wall, the patients with views of trees had shorter post-operative stays, they needed fewer doses of narcotic medications for pain, they elicited fewer negative comments on nurses' notes and had fewer post-surgical complications. Research continues to be conducted today about the beneficial nature of plants and nature. For example, this study focuses on the beneficial impact of incorporating biophilic features, such as access to greenery and natural light into our homes and workplace. In this 2014 study by Browning and Cooper, they found in the in their survey of the global office landscape, that 47% of workers had no access to natural light and that 58% had no access to any sort of greenery. When these elements were introduced, they noted a 15% increase in the sense of well being, a 6% increase in productivity, and a 15% increase in creativity. Now, in the US, the national advocate for using horticulture as a therapeutic medium is the American Horticultural Therapy Association. The association serves to promote and advance horticultural therapy as a therapeutic intervention. The AHTA publishes the Journal of Therapeutic Horticulture and recognizes registered horticultural therapists through a voluntary professional registration program. Today, we see wellness programs that might be vocational, therapeutic, or social in nature that spring from this thought that nature heals. So what exactly is therapeutic horticulture defined? The AHTA's definition of therapeutic horticulture and horticultural therapy are illustrated here. And while we can see that there are differences between the two, the commonalities stand out. This healing model proposes that the intervention is provided to a person with an identified disability, illness, or life circumstance. That it is facilitated by a trained professional 
and that it uses horticultural activities to address overall program goals or those goals in individualized treatment plans. Each person comes to us with a specific set of needs related to this disability or illness or life circumstance. Therefore, using a person-centered or humanistic approach to facilitate the therapeutic process is a natural fit. The core conditions of this school of thought guiding our work include a congruent relationship with the client, a relationship of unconditional positive regard, and that there's an empathetic understanding that is conveyed to our clients. Carl Rogers states that the individual within, has within himself or herself vast resources for self-understanding, for altering his or her self-concept, attitudes, and directed behavior, and that these resources can be tapped when a climate of facilitative attitudes is provided. We provide that facilitative climate by focusing on accessibility and adaptability. In this person-centered mindset, effectively attending to the specific needs of a client is of primary importance. We place great emphasis on customizing our treatment spaces to optimize client autonomy and independence by focusing on accessibility and adaptability of spaces and methodology. By doing so, we create the opportunity for that client to reap the benefits of, the, of people plant engagement. In these images here, vertical growing spaces with lettuces are ready for harvest. And a walking stick is adapted to, make, to a tool to make holes for the planting of garlic bulbs. Some additional examples of accessibility are shown here. These are taken at the Garden of Hope at Good Samaritan Hospital in Suffern, New York. Features like vertical growing spaces or garden towers that rotate so that the plants move to the client rather than the client moving to access the plant. And then in center, a wheelchair accessible planting bed which provides a success-oriented planting experience from either a sitting or a standing position. Other accessibility features might include raised planting beds at various heights or planting crops that have contrasting colors. For example, yellow snow peas or purple beans that provide contrast with the green foliage, thereby allowing someone with compromised vision to better see ripened fruits. Trellising these fruiting vines, such as cucumbers, which would normally grow along the ground, allows for a person with mobility issues to harvest from standing position. The options for creating these accessible spaces are as vast as one's creative mind. Another way to create opportunities for people with disabilities to participate in gardening activities is to provide them with the proper tools. Here we see some examples of adaptive tools and tools that have been modified to enable participation. Starting at the upper left and moving clockwise, these dibble sticks have been fitted with spacers to stop the dibble at the proper depth for planting seeds. It is useful for people with visual impairments and also for students with sensory integration issues who may have difficulty with judging three-dimensional space. Next, long handle tools allow gardeners to reach planting areas from a seated position. Often a tool designed for children may be just the right length and weight. Water weighs almost eight pounds to the gallon. A plastic water bottle can be converted into a lightweight watering aid by fitting it with a screw top on spout and turning it into a lightweight watering device requiring only a squeeze. Seating and shaded areas are essential in a therapeutic garden to provide areas for respite and to avoid tiring. The seat shown here on the lower right 
has an added advantage of being able to roll as one gardens, making the experience less tiring and possibly even more enjoyable. Seating templates or planting frames shown in the center bottom are a wonderful tool for participants who have visual impairments and also for those who have tracking or figure ground discrimination difficulties. The templates directs the location of the seed and its color provides a focus point and provides contrast with the soil. Ergonomic tools are designed to minimize stress and prevent injury, especially with repetitive gardening movements, such as digging, which puts a lot of stress and pressure on the nerves of the wrist. Often the best tool is modified in a way that is particular to a participant's needs. An example would be for a person who has arthritic hand joints, building up the handle with foam to make a comfortable grip would enable them to participate without experiencing pain. What do we take into consideration the features to enhance accessibility and adaptability? We then carefully choose the plant material with which we will work. Sensory stimulation is important for normal neurological and psychological functioning and the development of our neurobiologic con constructs. We know of its impact on children developing sense their senses, as noted in Richard Louv's book, The Last Child into the Woods. We also witness the positive impact in the elder population whose senses may be declining due to the aging process. And most certainly in those people who are dealing with sensory loss. Here we see tomatoes that give us visual stimulation. We also can see lavender and basil, which engage our sense of smell. We also look at the bottom right for this calancho, which has a soft, fuzzy feel to it, engaging our tactile senses. And then we also look at the auditory sense, grasses blowing in the wind, the crackle of leaves under our feet. Through the careful selection of plant material used in our work, we can better address the specific needs of a participant or work toward a goal to create an impactful multi-sensory experience. So often we see the act of gardening or working with plants as just that, as gardening. But when we look at the process more closely, we recognize the myriad of benefits that derive from it. For example, physical benefits. If we consider a person with decreased mobility, perhaps in legs or back, accessible features like a vertical growing space could offer the opportunity to engage, maybe harvest from a standing position, working on standing tolerance or balance. And this is quite often not realized by the participant because they are focused more on the plant related activity. Or we can consider a person who may need to address fine motor skill refinement or eye-hand coordination. They might do so through the sowing of seeds using a planting frame that we saw pictured in an earlier slide. But I'd also like to draw attention to the physiological benefits that we often cannot see. For example, decreases in blood pressure and heart rate, decreases in levels of cortisol production, or increases in oxygenation levels resulting from that very engagement of working with plants. Nature also offers, offers cognitive benefits. For a person with dementia, nature provides great experiences to stimulate cognitive functioning. Orienting to the day, time of year, weather, season, may help with short-term memory loss. Reminiscence with favorite scents from flowers such as lilac, peony, and rose can trigger long-term memories of events and milestones in their lives. For someone with traumatic brain injury, an effective activity for cognitive retraining 
is the preparation of fresh greens for a market sale. The participant can cut the spring salad mix, wash them, weigh them, and bag and label for sale. This, this type of activity would help the participant in increasing their ability to focus, follow directions in a sequential order, and to do a task to completion. The repetition in this activity is on purpose and effective. When we consider psychoemotional benefits of the people-plant relationship, we often find feelings of empowerment and self-esteem impacted. A person with disabilities is often the recipient of care. However, this relationship shifts when working with plants. And as the person engages in caring for them, they now become the provider of care for another living being. Studies have noted decreases in feelings of depression and anxiety as well. A person struggling with feelings of depression may find a renewed sense of hope in the simple task of sowing a seed, watching it as it germinates, and then emerging from the soil. Anxiety issues can also be addressed in this process by incorporating mindful practice and the focus on the breath we can foster the acquisition of stress reduction tools that participants can then use in their everyday life. Another benefit is in the area of social benefits. For example, social skills can be a challenging concept for students on the autism spectrum. By participating in an activity with another person or with a small group, goals such as establishing eye contact, using words to communicate, and taking turns are all social skills, which in reality are really life skills that can be practiced during a horticultural activity. Another benefit worth noting is actually financial benefit. Vocational training can be part of a therapeutic horticulture program and provide opportunity to learn new job skills that may lead to employment or possibly entrepreneurship opportunities. It's also so empowered, empowering to be self-sufficient in growing your own food and being able to create decor for your home instead of purchasing commercially available items. When we examined the beginnings of how horticulture was used therapeutically, we saw that the practice was focused mainly on mental health and physical rehabilitation. How has it grown and evolved into serving a much more diverse population than ever before? Let's take a look at some of the settings and people served today. Therapeutic horticulture has been shown to have positive benefits for the elderly. Indoor gardening also has been reported to be effective for improving sleep, agitation, and cognition in dementia patients. Therapeutic horticulture is practiced in a wide variety of uh, locations, in retirement communities, adult day programs, continuing continuum of care services from assisted living through independent and long-term care. Botanical gardens and arboreta, community health centers, and nonprofit health agencies often, often offer therapeutic horticulture programs in the form of support groups. People with cancer, arthritis, multiple sclerosis, heart disease, and other chronic debilitating conditions can derive great benefit using garden metaphors and sharing experiences. For incarcerated populations, most people who end up in prison come from a variety of lifelong difficulties that include growing up in environments of poverty, 
low levels of formal education, childhood abuse, limited options, and a lack of role models for earning a living honestly. An inmate working in a prison garden can learn job skills, contribute to the common good by growing food for others, and find a focus for their lives post-release. Participation in therapeutic horticulture has also been shown to decrease recidivism rates when compared with other types of rehabilitation programs. Because of legislation like ADA, persons with disabilities are more and more able to access the therapeutics inherent in nature. Programs, many of which developed with a vocational focus, have been firmly established, offering a host of benefits for their participants. From feelings emerging, positive feelings emerging at the harvesting of fruits and vegetables, to the feelings of self-worth and sense of purpose, knowing that their skilled work contributed to being production and sold at farmers markets. Access to restorative spaces for healthcare professionals are very instrumental in offering a place to decompress, rejuvenate and restore so that these professionals can then better attend to their patients. This need has not been more prominent as it is now in light of what our communities have been enduring deal with dealing with the coronavirus. And finally, programs for veterans, offering a space to perhaps learn new skills and assist in the reintegration process into civilian life. At the New York Botanical Gardens, we have been honored to have developed a collaborative relationship with the J.J. Peters Veterans Administration Medical Center in the Bronx. Thrive, a therapeutic horticulture and rehabilitative intervention for veteran engagement, is a three-year ILMS grant and functions as part of the Resilience and Wellness Center at the Bronx VA. Therapeutic horticulture is offered to monthly cohorts of veterans who are mixed in gender, age, race, and need. Data has been collected in this pilot study, which is presently being written up as a program evaluation, motivating us to consider a proposal for therapeutic horticulture studies in the near future. Our program goals are varied and our objectives are varied as well. We create opportunities promoting group cohesion, which offer a supportive atmosphere where relationships grow and develop. The importance of bonding has been found to be critical in the veteran population in alleviating a sense of loneliness and depressive thought. We engage in activities which foster a sense of empowerment tapping into the inner wells of strength and resilience once used in their military service. This resilience is transformed into a resource for the increased sense of physical and psychological well-being. We not only pay attention to the growing process, but to that of moving it from the soil to our table. Activities which involve cooking and nutrition target the importance of overall physical health, which is instrumental in establishing overall well being. Learning is always a focus in the Thrive program. In the upper right, you see the thinning of Swiss chard seedlings into larger containers. Skills are developed that may be influential here in obtaining future employment in the horticultural field. And last, but certainly not least, we have an overarching objective of working towards self-compassion and forgiveness. The relationship between people and plants is a forgiving one. It is a non-judgmental one. One where we become mindful of where we are in a given moment and accept what is. When working with plants, there always exists the opportunity to begin anew. 
I'd like to close with a few anecdotal anecdotes from our veterans. And keep in mind that these journal entries were written upon first entering the gates of the Edible Academy in the midst of a cold January or February day. And through these words, you will come to understand the depth of the soulful impact of the restorative environment that is provided at the New York Botanical Gardens. As I walked in this space, I noticed I felt enthusiastic, almost excited to breathe, touch, and feel alive and at one with nature. Being among the living, birth, growth, rebirth, death, recycled nourishment, a cycle of life, ever-changing, motion, perpetual motion. In this space, I feel a connection with my surroundings. I am overwhelmed with a sense of calm, feeling of calm. Nothing needs to be said standing in this space. Nature has choreographed for me a beautiful symphony of peace and harmony. Thank you, Anne, for your work with this program and also to the vets for sharing such poetic reflections that I believe reinforce everything that we uh, discussed today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our audience. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation and it has added to your understanding of how horticulture functions as a therapeutic medium. Most of all, it is our hope that as we go forward in uncertain times that you take uh, time for yourself and think about um, some of the things that we spoke about today in terms of your own well-being, and also going forward to continue to support the ADA community. Our contact information uh, appears on this slide, and we just want to um, let you know that we do have a certificate program in horticultural therapy at the New York Botanical Garden. I serve as the program coordinator and Anne is the program advisor, and all of our instructors are registered horticultural therapists. So if this topic interests you and you'd like to learn more about the program, please reach out to us. You can take a class, which of course now are online, or think about pursuing a certificate. Once again, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you both so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure all the participants have a lot of questions. Um, however, I'm going to encourage everyone to save their questions till the end, or you can write them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll get to them after our next presentation. So our next speakers are Brooke Gibbard and Desiree Austin. Brooke is the garden coordinator of the Edible Academy at the New York Botanical Garden. She received a BS in Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources from Michigan State University. Welcome, Brooke. And Desiree Austin is a participant at the New York Foundlings Community Pre-Vocational Program and an enthusiastic volunteer at the New York Botanical Gardens Edible Academy. Welcome, Desiree. Hello. I'll hand doing? it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. And thank you, Ann and Phyllis, as well, for your presentation. A really big thank you to Desiree for being here with me today. It's very nice to see you again, Desiree. You. Um, so Desiree was a service learning volunteer at the Edible Academy uh, last year. She's going to share some of that experience with us today and some of the projects that we worked on together. Um, but before we get to those, Let's just give a little introduction to who we are, um, what we do at the Edible Academy here, and some of the therapeutic horticulture that we practice. So on the screen now is a bird's eye view taken with a drone camera of the Edible Academy site. Um, so the site here, uh, the family garden on the left side of the image has been with the New York Botanical Garden for many, many years. 
um, but the Edible Academy and this new education facility was renovated and open to the public in 2018, so two years ago. Um, and with that renovation, we had a couple upgrades and updates to our infrastructure that fortunately made us more accessible. So we are part of the education department here at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, we're teaching garden that teaches about organic vegetable gardening and cooking. We also have new sustainability features that can be seen in this photo, like a solar pavilion and a green roof. So we teach topics about sustainability and ecology as well. And we generally have registered programs available for students, classes, school groups, and field trips available for children. And um, we also open in the afternoons to the general public and garden visitors. Um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic this year, we have been closed on site. Um, so the left side of our campus is currently still closed, but we are reevaluating all of our programs for the fall. And we're really, really excited and hopeful that we'll welcome people back to the Edible Academy soon and safely. So typically we have many, many hands involved in tending and taking care of the garden. And so we miss all of those hands and um, all of the participants in our program have a gardening uh, section of their program. And we also have a very big dozens and dozens of volunteers that help us to tend to the garden. And our volunteer program is really where our service learning program evolved. So the service learning program is a project-based garden program. So that really centers on the process of gardening rather than the results of just harvesting a certain number of vegetables, let's say. So we work with individuals. We're also open to groups that wanna sign up for the service learning program. And the goal of that program could vary from wanting to simply be outside and be out in nature and have physical exercise and work in the community, maybe grow, learn how to grow your own food or just garden with other people. Uh, another, another goal of the program sometimes is just uh, job skills training or pre-vocational experience. So depending on the group, um, we might have different activities that are planned, um, but we work with um, non-disabled. We also work with individuals on the autism spectrum and individuals with developmental disability. So just to give a glance a little bit more into our garden areas that we have here, Anne and Phyllis had mentioned that there is, the ADA had created accessible design features and standards for design. So some of those here at the garden are our new pathways. So we used to have lawn pathways that are now with the renovation uh, aggregate material called gravel lock, um, and they're wider now. So better mobility for getting through to the garden. And some of our growing spaces are level in the ground and you can use long handled stand up tools. We also have low wooden raised beds. Um, so these areas really involve the bending, crouching, kneeling, sitting um, for gardening. So some of the tools that we use to assist us are garden stools. Um, so our example here are the green stools shown in the two pictures on the bottom. And those are nice because you can use them as a seat and you can convert them, flip them over and use them to kneel on and they'll provide some extra arm support for working out in our outdoor spaces. In addition to our outdoor spaces in the ground, we have some vertical spaces. Um, so Anne mentioned that vertical spaces are a very great way to do stand-up work or maybe work in a wheelchair side to side with some plants. And so here on the left is an image of our cucumelons. So those are vining plants that are supported by a wall with a built-in trellis. And to the right is an image of our herb beds. So those herb beds are tall raised beds that can do stand-up work. And they also feature, the plants in those areas are edible, and they're also very aromatic, um, sensory, good sensory plants to engage our senses. It's a very common place to start off a work day and just decompress, say hello to the garden next to our herb wall. In the center is a photo of our wide grab lock pathways and a meadow area where we also grow some of the native pollinator plants, and we, we get to know the different creatures that are part of our garden ecosystem. And you can also see 
our greenhouse. So the greenhouse is a new space added to the Edible Academy 2018 with the renovation. And on this slide, you can see a closer look into that space. Um, so our greenhouse on the top right shows that we have tables for our growing. All of the seeds that are started are eventually planted out into the garden. And we have four work tables here as well. So we, we do use this area year round, mainly in the spring to start our plants, but it is a great option for a very snowy day or a very rainy day to stay in a safe, comfortable area. Um, something that we've learned is that it, it's very hot to work for a long period of time in this space at this time of year in the summer. So we were really interested in getting a comfortable space um, that was also a wheelchair accessible workspace. And that project that we've started is shown in the image on the left. So here you see behind our greenhouse, a space we call the nursery. And the nursery here has a new boardwalk and that boardwalk is ADA compliant. And that's what it looks like today. So in the future, we are looking to build to the right where you can see some storage bins currently. Um, we'll have a wheelchair uh, accessible potting station and a stand up potting station. And this picture also shows the posts in the ground that will provide some shade structure here so that we can have a nice comfortable space to work in. And while working on some of the tasks in this space, we have found that some of these tools shown at the bottom right have really helped. So Anne mentioned having various watering devices, watering uh, different weight cans or different um, cans that offer one-handed use, two-handed use, or different rate of water flow. So a spray mister as opposed to a watering can, as opposed to a hose, um, is a great way to progress through that skill physically. Uh, another neat tool that we have are our seeding tools. So on the bottom right is a picture of small green containers that hold seeds and allow you to slowly tap out a small seed or two at a time and a vacuum seeder, which allows you to pick up a very small seed one at a time. So you can really practice these skills um, at, a, at a level that's comfortable to you. And that's really good for seeds like basil, basil or onions that are very small and maybe hard to see or hard to handle. So that's a quick rundown of our site and some of the features here that we've built into the new Edible Academy. Now I am so happy to reintroduce and bring in Desiree to the conversation. Hello again, Desiree. Hello. Um, so Desiree, we'll have some pictures up here, beautiful slideshow of some of the projects that we worked on together. And I'd love if you could share with everybody, you know, what we were doing and that project and maybe something that you learned um, while working on that project as well. Hello, my name is Desiree. And in this project, we are digging holes and putting seeds in the ground. And that project, and <clears throat> sorry. And in the other picture, we digging, we put in the seeds in the ground and in this picture that we are in, that we watered them and put the seeds in the water and to the ground to let them grow. Yes, we planted a lot of seeds together. And besides just planting the seeds, were there other skills that you were practicing or thinking about while we were doing this task? Um, teamwork. That's a big one, yeah. So teamwork, we had set it up so um, you can see the rest of um, the New York Foundling team here. And each each uh, person was responsible for their area of seed sowing. But at the end, we had a nice, a nice row that we planted together. Yeah. So. All right, what are we working on in this next photo? In this photo, I am watering plants. We are. And do you want to describe um, the different tools that you're, you're using in each picture? In, that, in this photo, we water in plants and we're using a water jug to water the plants. And then in the other picture, we are using a hose. Yes. We did a lot of seeding, a lot of watering together. So those are two really big projects that were out in the garden as well as inside. Okay, what about these next, next projects here? And this project, 
we are um, picking out beans and putting them in a big pan in a big bucket. Yes, soybeans. And what were some of the things that we were learning together um, while we were harvesting? What were some job skills that you might have been working on? Um, team skills, um, team skills, and socializing with other people that that was not I don't know, but I did. But I started learning to know their names and and learn her names and people's and other people's names. Yes, so that's a good mention for the picture on the right. We have a big mix of people at the garden, not even just at the Edible Academy, that we got to kind of work together with. So teamwork is definitely a big, big part of what we do here. Thank you. Let's move on to some more photos. What are we doing in these? And these ones are, we are picking out those ones. Onions, yeah, those are onions. He's picking out onions. And then next one, we're picking out carrots. And the next one, we are picking out the sorry bean, the, 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 the durkin. Durkins, yes, you got it. That's a tough one to remember. So you did, uh, you did a lot of harvesting. And so do you want to speak at all to, was it just harvesting or what else were you doing while you were harvesting? We harvest... Um, we count them out in the buckets. We did a lot of stuff with them. We did harvest, we did counting, we did cooking with them. We learned how to share it with the community. Absolutely, and that brings us to our next photo here as well. So talk more about how we shared it with the community. How did we share it with everybody? Um, we count how many tomatoes or how many carrots to give out to the, com to the community. Mm -hmm. because we have to use the rest of the stuff to, for the cooking class. Right. In that picture, we was allowed to take some vegetables, stuff to our community, to our houses. Yes. So in the center is a picture of the cooking class that you mentioned. So what were some of the things that you would help with with the cooking class? What were your, what were your tasks there? In the cooking classes, I would give out the recipes to the community. And I help with the, the cooking classes, like the projects that we was doing. So like if they needed water or certain seed, um, seeds or certain ingredients to put in the Thing. Absolutely. And you were very, very good at it. I have to say you brought a lot of your own skills and your own experiences um, to, to us and to those cooking demonstrations, which we were so lucky to have. Um, so thank you again for sharing. Um, so, so you really did work on a lot of different things here. So I'm curious too, if you want to share, were, were there any like challenges that you had to overcome with this type of work or anything like that that you'd like to speak to? Challenges, it was kind of hot outside. I couldn't take the heat, but I ain't gonna lie about it, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, experience, it was learning to talk to the community and teach them how we learn how different plants you could grow with, like cook with and do stuff with different plants. I didn't know that. <laughs> and different um, flowers, like sun sunflower seeds. I didn't know that you make a sunflower sun with seeds. Mm -hmm. I, I, also, I also myself learn new things in the garden every day and from all the people that we get to work with. So, um, I love yeah. working with the kids. Uh, yes, yes. And they loved working with you. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you, that you would like to share uh, about your experience or? I loved it. Loves it? Oh, yes, I love it. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Desiree. I think we will open it, open it up for, for questions so we can um, throw it back to Samantha. And if you are interested too, as well, to learn more, I think we'll add into the chat um, some links that you can go to nybg.org and learn more about the Edible Academy, the service learning program, and volunteer opportunities here at the Garden. Thank you so much, Desiree and Brooke. This was really nice for you to recap your experience and share with us what you're all doing at the Edible Academy. 
Um, so now is the time for a Q&A. Uh, so for any of the participants who may have questions, um, thank, first of all, thank you all for attending. And if there are questions, you have two choices. You can write them into the Q&A function down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or you can raise your hand if you prefer to ask your question aloud and we will unmute you. Um, okay, so let me just see if we have any questions here. Oh, we have uh, one that came in. Um, I'm guessing this is for all speakers. Um, what have been some of your most difficult challenges using horticulture therapy with populations with special needs? Um, I'd like to jump in on this one um, because Desiree brought something uh, to our attention that can really be used as a therapeutic tool. And that is uh, the challenge that I find dealing with those uncontrollable, uh, uncontrollable variables, like the weather, right? So I may have a program, um, you know, completely orchestrated, but then we have thunderstorms or we have, you know, 95 degree heat. And so the, the challenge there is to actually embrace those, those variables, and to make them into a learning experience. Many of the people with whom we work are um, extremely uh, find, you know, it beneficial to have organization in their life. And so sometimes when you get thrown a monkey wrench, um, it kind of puts us off kilter. And so practicing being able to be flexible and um, address the things that are the hurdles and obstacles that are put in our way in the garden, we can actually take that and transfer it to daily living. So I think that that is, um, Desiree, you ex described it beautifully. Brooke, Phyllis, do you have any uh, challenges that come to mind? I, I would second Anne's comment too that <laughs> the, the variation in the weather, the variation in the individual even or the group and not even them, but the day that it is and what went on in that morning that could be affecting you know, what am I bringing to my day? I think we all bring things to our days sometimes. So the, the beautiful thing is being able to, even as an instructor, release that and be open to this experience together. And the learning really comes out of the process and a safe safe space to be able to practice a process of learning something rather than necessarily just feeling like I have to be in this role of, of teaching and, and doing everything exactly. Um, you know, you can also be the learner and you can also learn together to have, to have that acceptance and that resilience for new things. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, Phil, do you want to add anything? Cause we do have a few other questions so I can move on. Um, I would just echo uh, what Ann and Brooke have so uh, well expressed. Um, just sometimes there are administrative challenges that need to be overcome. And my only advice would be keep your eye on the prize. Remember what you're doing and why you're doing it. And there may be some workarounds, but stick with it. And um, you know, good things will come. Thank you. So our next question is actually about adaptive tools. Um, so somebody wants to know one, it's a two-part question. One, where can you purchase adaptive tools? And two, are therapists working with industrial designers for better gardening tools? That is a great question. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I'll, I'll start and just quickly say, um, I go through multiple vendors to, to get accessible tools. I, I don't know, I can't speak to how much they're working with designers for these tools, mm -hmm. um, but uh, Johnny Seeds has some accessible tools. Uh, Kinsman Company is one that has some accessible tools available as well. Um, and if they aren't working with industrial designers, I think they should. <laughs> um, and certainly hospitals and, and other facilities could have some real opportunity for partnerships there to design. Um, like Anne said in her presentation too, like the limits are kind of limitless if you have this creative mind for each individual. So. I think we also see um, that tools are oftentimes customized 
to someone in the process of maybe their occupational therapy. I think these allied professions like occupational, recreational, and physical therapies, we're working so closely with, with our clients and, and our participants that we really, it's important for us to be able to customize to the specific needs of each person. I think that this is one of the reasons why there's not like a, a warehouse or distribution center of adaptable tools because everyone's needs are, are specific to them. Um, and so we create, really. Um, many, of a hort, many a horticultural therapy program have literally hort therapists working with even a toy maker who has that kind of creative edge that's able to, to make something that is out of the box. I often say we work try to work out of the box, we try to work with no box and just create what we need when we need it. Yeah, and I would just like to add that, um, you know, I've had students uh, approach me and say, you know, I've been given a budget and I need to, I need to purchase tools. And uh, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, tools can be expensive. And the only thing I would recommend is that, um, of course, uh, as a facilitator of programs in therapeutic horticulture, you really need to observe your participants very carefully because sometimes a purchase tool does not match up with what the person needs or it doesn't really work the way you think it might want to work, you would want it to work. So um, you might be amazed that, you know, in your kitchen, workshop, garage, there are so many items that you know, with a little creativity, you may be able to adapt in some way. Um, and uh, it's actually part of a class that we offer in our certificate program where uh, I give students just, you know, um, a variety of things from, from those locations that are in your home or um, from the hardware store. And we brainstorm about how they could be adapted into something that would be uh, ad an adaptive tool. And uh, so you're really only limited by your creativity. And the more you observe and also work with the person, um, it's a problem solving thing that you can involve your participant in. Thank you. Sarah. So um, that's just another take on, you know, buying tools and, and creating them on your own. That's a very thorough answer from all of you. Thank you. We actually have a two part question for Desiree. Um, Desiree. Have you used what you've learned at the Edible Academy at home, whether it's cooking or gardening? And then the second question is, what is your favorite part of your experience at the Edible Academy? I've been cooking more. I've been cooking for myself more. Oh, than that's great. Family. And the second question, um, my favorite part about over there, it was learning how to do those skills because if we didn't know how to cook, when I'm getting them help, I didn't know how to cook as much and learning how di different parts of doing, um, you could do with um, vegetables and tomatoes and different kind of stuff. That's great. And um, did you make any friends uh, during your time at the Edible Academy that you still keep in touch with? Yes, I did. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes, I did. Um, so I have two more questions here for the purposes of time. Um, we have a two-part question, which, uh, what means have you used to engage healthcare professionals? And then the second one in related is, um, is the future of inpatient care greening the space? Mm. Um, I'd like to speak to this one. Um, being uh, centered at Good Samaritan Hospital during the entire uh, COVID experience that started with us in March, early March, uh, we were, we deemed at that point that we were not able to uh, have our community members come in, right? They, it was just horticultural therapy programming was going to cease in that, in that capacity. What ended up happening was that the garden became a, a place of respite for our staff members. And it was not even a, um, an announced uh, place. It was something that they came upon maybe as they walked outside of the building. And so how do we, is it an active engagement? It begins as passive. 
It begins upon their volition, their decision to come into the space. And then it's, it's you know, my responsibility as a, a horticultural therapist to be able to engage, how much do, we, do I want to actively engage and facilitate the process? The person may be able to do it all by themselves just by being quiet. And that may, in, in essence, be exactly what they need at that point in time. So. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Um, Brooke, there's one that seems like for you uh, specifically, has the Edible Academy program been replicated elsewhere? Uh, and I guess, Anne, you could also speak to this, whether it's the Thrive program or Brooke, your program. So um, I guess both of you can quickly speak on that. Before Go we ahead, Brooke. Up. Sure. Um, I do think that there, the farm to table movement has encouraged a lot of new organizations to develop um, a, like vegetable gardening uh, programs for kids. Um, in terms of like a service learning program, I, I know there are other botanical, botanical gardens that offer this. Um, Chicago Botanical Garden is one, Brooklyn Botanical Garden is one. Um, and I, I do think it is, I'm very hopeful that it is the future as well. So I think, I, I, and I really believe that we'll see more partnerships um, between schools and botanical gardens and parks and hopefully hospitals and, and facilities, um, healing facilities, nursing home rehab centers are also involved in that. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that that's, um, they do exist, they're on the rise and hopefully, um, hopefully they continue. And as far as the, the Thrive program specifically, um, while I do know that there are many programs for veterans, one of the programs in the Veteran Administration that has been rolled out over the last few years has been this whole health model of care. And the Resilience and Wellness Center um, is part of that whole health model. To my knowledge, Hortic this horticultural therapy program, this Thrive program, is singular. I, I don't know that it has been replicated in that it really focuses on resilience and wellness inside the realm of a botanical garden. And I think that that's a key difference because we do see it incorporated in the whole health model and resilience and wellness in agricultural settings, for sure. But as far as bringing that and collaborating um, in such depth um, as we are in the Thrive program, that I have not seen. But I completely could be off base here. It's just something that I'm not completely sure of. Thank you. Um, thank you all for sharing your experiences, your presentations, and your expertise with us. Um, and thank you, thank you all to the participants for attending today's presentation. There are more questions, um, but we are out of time. Um, so please send us your queries uh, by email or right now we'll capture them in the Q&A and we'll forward them to our speakers. Um, if you missed any part or want to watch this again or share this with anyone, a recording will be archived and shared online at the NYBG Lecture Library. If you liked this webinar, which I'm sure most of you did based on all the wonderful questions, um, join us for our next program uh, held in a few weeks on August 21st. And it's uh, New York's foremost citizen scientist, John Beersey, who will speak on Alley Creek Wetlands, a floristic quality assessment. Until then, please stay well, stay green and take care. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>